Intelligence preparation of the battle space, or IPB, is a basic intelligence process to analyze threats in a specific geographic area. Sounds pretty simple, doesn't it? Well, in some ways it is, in some ways it's a lot more complex than you think. So what is IPB, and why is it worth even talking about? Well, to answer that, let's go through the process and see what it's all about. Step one is to define the operational environment. This very first step is actually two different steps. You must determine how large the battle space is and determine how much time you have to work with. As we all know, work expands to fill the time allotted, so if you've got a big area and not a lot of time, your product is not going to be that in-depth. In this first step, we also must consider commander's intent. We have to know what our boss wants. In a civilian capacity, we must consider the needs of those who we are trying to assist. We must recognize that the people that we are working for, or who we are trying to help out, will rarely be fully aware of the considerations outside of their area of expertise. Everyone is different, and every unit has a different mission. For instance, the commander of an artillery unit might be mostly concerned about ground threats, such as counter-battery elements, but a fighter wing commander might be more concerned about air defense threats. Likewise, a civilian audience might mostly be concerned about law enforcement activity or domestic military operations in their local area. It's the job of the analyst to consider factors that a commander might not be specifically thinking about. For the S2 shop, the operational environment is usually much larger than the actual combat zone, in order to consider factors outside the immediate area that might impact actions on the ground. In other words, if something is outside of your AO, outside of your area of operations, and therefore not your problem, that doesn't mean that it can't come into your area of operations and suddenly become your problem. Moving on to step two, we can describe battlefield effects. At this stage, we can determine how the environment can shape operations. A significant portion of this step lies with conducting terrain analysis and determining adversary composition and disposition on the battlefield. In short, we need to find out what the terrain is like and where the enemy is located on that terrain. In this step, you're going to spend an awful lot of time hunched over a map. We also need to determine how we can use the terrain to our advantage and any obstacles that might hinder our operation, which we can annotate on a modified combined obstacle overlay, or MIKU. Weather is very important to consider in this step as well, and its effect on the battle space, which can be quite significant. Understanding local civilian culture and organization is also crucial, particularly in an asymmetric warfare context. Identifying mobility corridors, key terrain, and other important terrain features will also be important for the next step, which is step three, evaluate the threat. Once terrain analysis is complete and we have done our best to locate and annotate enemy forces on our map, we can begin to war game enemy actions. In this step, we must take care to have an open mind. It is easy to get carried away and jump right to step 4 without fully exploring what threats we face. Assessing an enemy's order of battle, or the list of vehicles and equipment that they have, is crucial to understanding what an enemy can and will do. For instance, if we only find enemy air defense assets, if there's just a couple of teams with man pads and maybe a dedicated air defense element or SAM site, we know that there's probably not going to be a significant infantry push in this area. However, if we see dozens and dozens or hundreds of tanks staging in an open field, well, we know something else is going on. Finally, we can move to step four, determining threat courses of action. Remember in step three, we first determined what courses of action the enemy is physically capable of. From there, we can determine what the enemy is most likely to do. First, we find out what an enemy can do. Now, we assess what they will do. Understanding the enemy's desired end state is helpful for determining what they will do, but at the tactical level, strategic plans are often not perceivable. If our AO is really small and we can only see a couple of platoons moving around, it's going to be very hard to find out what the rest of the army's main objectives are. But from this step, we can narrow down the courses of action we have created to determine what's most likely, but always keeping the worst case, most dangerous scenario in mind. At this stage, it is important to be realistic with your COA development, particularly the most deadly COA. The most deadly, most dangerous COA is often not taken seriously by analysts and commanders alike due to lacking realism. The most deadly COA should not be a blanket statement, but rather specific to the forces on the ground. 
For instance, if your most dangerous situation is the use of tactical nuclear weapons, this would be a redundant observation. If your answer is always, well, worst case scenario, they nuke us, this isn't really helpful. Your most dangerous COA should be something like, this unit over here has an extra man pad that we didn't know about, and they shoot us down upon infiltrating the area. This allows even the most dangerous COA to be mitigated responsibly, rather than being a hopeless event that can't really be planned for. Once we figure out what the enemy is most likely to do, we're pretty much done. Well, not really. IPB is a continual process and is constantly changing. You really won't ever be able to say that the IPB for an area is done, because it's never really complete. As the battle wages on, IPB changes by the second, usually so quickly that you won't even have time to update your PowerPoint slides. If all of this sounds a little bit too military-centric, don't worry. IPB is a process that can be of much benefit to the prepared citizen who is concerned with conducting operations in their local area. In military circles, IPB is very much a small piece of a much larger puzzle, a small part of the planning and decision-making process. However, from a civilian perspective, we will likely not have rigid command and planning considerations to speak of. Civilians might be more concerned with in-depth terrain analysis rather than the grand strategy that is important to military commanders. The average prepared citizen might not even have any organization at all beyond a platoon-sized element. Citizens will also not have nearly the resources of a military organization, but they will also not have the bloat and administrative red tape either. IPB is a great tool for understanding your local area and applying other concepts within the field of intelligence. As such, IPB for the prepared citizen is much more of a guide of what to put on the map rather than an overarching process that feeds into MDMP. For the civilian, IPB can flex as needed and serve as the minimum baseline of intelligence activity for prepared citizens. For the prepared citizen, we might not have time to sit down in a nice, well-lit, warm office building and actually conduct IPB. We might have 30 minutes in a blank sheet of paper. So in that case, here is a very rough, quick and dirty way of conducting IPB. The first step is to get a map, which might be quite challenging. Printers are not normally found in a combat zone, so you might have to make do with the best you have. Plus, a lot of times, at least in military circles, maps are more of a status symbol. The bigger map a person has, the more important they are. So do what you've got to do to get a map. If you want to make one yourself beforehand, that would be preferred, because then you can scale it to the right size that you need it to be. In this first step, we're actually taking care of a couple of different steps. We are defining the operational environment by choosing a map right off the bat that is the right size for the area that we're talking about. Once we have our map, we can move to step two. And step two is pretty simple. Simply put everything on the map. All of the stuff listed on your screen right now. This is obviously a place to start, so if you have more time, you can flex as needed. But really, you need to focus on mobility, terrain, weather, and the enemy. Start with your basic roads, your primary roads that can be used to move in and out of an area. Those are also really good if you have to sketch the map. It's easier to start by sketching the roads. Next, start adding in a little bit of terrain. Some of the higher areas, if you're in a mountainous area, this is going to be a little bit easier because you can see where the mountains are at, and it's a little bit easier to get landmarks in a mountainous region because it's a little easier to, to read homemade topographic maps that you sketch out on the ground with your finger, as opposed to an area which is completely flat where you might not be able to see anything but trees and uh, man-made landmarks. Next, start factoring in the weather. If you have a Kestrel or uh, some other kind of weather meter, turn it on so that it can start getting readings. You're going to need to start establishing a baseline of weather patterns as early as possible so that you have as much data to work with. If you're conducting aviation operations, things like visibility, winds, precipitation, and density altitude are going to be very important for your pilots to know. Likewise, if you're working near the coastline, you're going to need to have things like tide charts or start observing the tides if you don't have a tide chart to work off of. You're also going to need to know things like sea state and wind speeds. Now that we've gotten our mobility corridors taken care of, we've started to think about our key terrain and start annotating obstacles and things like that, and we've started to get a good baseline for what the local weather is. Now we can start putting down the enemy. Basically, put down every enemy location that you know of. If you know where the enemy are at, put it on the map. If you don't know where they're at, put where you think they are. And for your assessment of where you think the enemy might be, well, that's why you conducted the analysis of the mobility corridors and terrain and weather. All three of those factors will help you understand where an adversary might be. Once you have done all of this, step back, look at your map, and start thinking about what the enemy is going to do based on all of the information that you know so far. 
Start by figuring out what your enemy can do, and then start thinking about what they will do. Narrow that down to a few courses of action, always keeping in mind what is the absolute worst case scenario, because you have to plan for that just in case, and you have just conducted your basic IPB for an area very quickly, very efficiently, with minimal or even zero resources. Conducting IPB like this might not be as doctrinally sound as we'd like it to be, but it's realistic, and it's what works in field conditions. This is why we have to consider the fog of war factor. We can read 213-page warfare publications, and we can sleep with a smart book tucked under our pillow. But at the end of the day, warfare changes everything, and you are never going to be able to complete all of the taskings given to you. You will simply have to do the best you can in the time that you have. It's going to feel awful, especially if you have very little experience outside of war games and NTC rotations. This is doubly so for the average citizen who might not have any military experience to lean back on. Practicing and training on this stuff really does help. So does creating your own little cheat sheets and organizational shortcuts to make life easier. If you understand how to make maps, that's a really good first step to get you started. But we must remember that while the field of intelligence is quite rigidly outlined in doctrine, when you're stuck in the thick of it, it's more about shooting from the hip than anything else. You are going to have to go with your gut more than you'd like, and more than the training manuals admit. That's why IPB is so important. By having some structure, a pre-existing plan, you can at least have a lot of background knowledge that will help you make educated guesses. In the intelligence field, we unfortunately have to make a lot of guesses, but we never make uneducated guesses. Your slides will become outdated, and you will probably embarrass yourself by briefing stale intelligence to people who know it's stale. You are going to forget to put something on the map, or you're going to forget about some technical capability that the enemy has. This is why we practice, and IPB is a good starting point for everyone regardless of field experience. And as you get better at it, you realize how warfare publications are usually written on mahogany conference tables in calm office buildings for people in calm office buildings with mahogany conference tables. But even considering these woes, all doctrine has to start somewhere. And every military strategist tries to make a name for themselves, even in peacetime where doctrine can't really be tested. So everything is a balance. We must take everything with a grain of salt, but we also must respect the fact that doctrine usually costs many lives to develop. So try to resist the urge to armchair quarterback everything, but also leave a lot of room for flexibility and the fog of war. Like everything else in the tactical world, you are going to suck at this to start with. Everyone does. The biggest problem is not knowing what you don't know. And since nobody would rather make maps than go to the range, these topics usually get neglected. Being difficult and boring is usually the final nail in the coffin for a community's intelligence preparedness. But it can be done, and you can work in these concepts during more fun activities. As you are playing around on ATAC in the woods, try plotting the features that you can see. If you see a good spot for an observation post, mark it on the map. Same with choke points, good places for radio antennas or snipers or a bunker. Then start thinking about how you or an adversary might use these resources or positions, and how that might change if someone starts shooting. Before you know it, you'll be conducting IPB without even realizing it. Once you get a few practice IPB sessions under your belt, you'll be good to go and more prepared to fight in the shade. Yes,